There we go, my fault. Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> it is a joy to be back. It is a joy to be with you this morning here in the sanctuary. It's been like a month since I've been here with you. It's, it's good to be back. I had a couple of very restful Sundays off, and before that, of course, we were uh, with our friends at Zion Lutheran Church. Um, I did get a message last Sunday from Reverend Rebecca Laird, who had filled in for me those two Sundays, and she said, oh my gosh, your congregation is so kind and thoughtful and generous, and I really, really hope they treat you as well as they treated me, and I said, they do. <laughs> so I'm really, really glad to be back, and I'm really, really glad that she had such a warm welcome here and that she was able to lead you in worship in my absence. A handful of announcements before we move into our time of worship. Uh, first, if you are participating in the Angel Tree Ministry, um, please sign up for a child's name from the Angel Tree. Please also sign up as an usher for December. If you are interested in doing so, you can see Pat. She's not in here right now. She must be making coffee. She's, a, she's about. I've seen her. Um, also a reminder, uh, in case you didn't notice on your way in, those of you who have offering envelopes provided by the church, uh, your envelopes are available just outside this door here, kind of near where the restrooms are. And so go ahead and look for your name and pick those up. Um, the more of you who take them home with you when you're here anyway, the more postage we save. So that's, uh, that's a, a gift to us if you would make sure you do that. The Christmas tree chosen for the Rockefeller Center Plaza, this is kind of a fun fact that has a tie to our community, uh, was donated by Matt and Jackie McGinley. Matt, um, uh, Matt I, I'm reading someone else's writing, so forgive me. Matt, of gym class hero renown, is the son of the late Donna and Mike McGin McGinley, who are members of this church. So that's a cool fun fact. If you see pictures of the Rockefeller Christmas tree, their son... The, the son of a, a couple from our congregation donated that. Um, another just uh, sort of community note, the lights at Lachlan in memory of Flo Hoyt can be seen at the Lachlan School three weekends during December from uh, 5 to 8 p.m. Flo was a longtime member of our congregation. And finally, we would appreciate any help you can give toward after church receptions. See Dottie or Norma. Um, and so if you are able to help out with receptions after church, please make sure uh, to touch base with Dottie and Norma. They are the co-chairs of our Connect team, which oversees sort of receptions and congregational care and that sort of internal um, relationship stuff. It's, it can be super easy. It can be cheese crackers, a bowl of grapes, and uh, some drinks. It can be very, very simple. Um, so if you're willing to help out with receptions, that would be wonderful. We're trying to make it so we can at least have a different person each week throughout the month and not have people doubling up during a month. One final announcement uh, about today specifically, that is that after worship, we'll be having a winter desserts celebration um, in the fellowship hall, in, in the lounge rather, right next door. Um, so please stay for some delicious desserts. And then during that time, uh, we'll be having a question and answer session about, um, about what's been going on between us and Zion Lutheran Church. Those of you who are uh, part of this faith community are aware that we've been pursuing a relationship with Zion Lutheran Church, considering the possibility of moving into their building in some sort of arrangement together with them and selling uh, this building at some point in the future. Um, we're continuing to actively pursue that possibility as a question of faithful Christian stewardship. And so I would encourage you to stay if you're interested in um, getting some questions answered to stay after worship. That Q&A session that's happening will also be Zoomed and recorded. So if folks aren't able to be here in person for that, there will be other ways for them to receive that information. Um, and if for no other reason, stay for the desserts and the fellowship. That's fun in and of itself. Looking ahead at the holiday season that, that we're in the midst of right now, we'll have a couple of special worship services. One on December 21st, there will be a service that we celebrate on the longest night of the year every year. Um, it's, it's geared specifically towards those who are grieving during the holiday season. We recognize that it's not all comfort and joy if there's an empty seat at your table. 
And so this is a service of hope and healing for, for those for whom that is true. Um, all are welcome, regardless of whether that's true for you, uh, but that's what the flavor of the service will be, the purpose of the service. And then, of course, on Christmas Eve, we will be here together in full splendor and celebration um, at 7 o'clock Christmas Eve. We will also have worship that morning. Christmas Eve is on a Sunday. I don't know if you looked that far ahead at your calendar, but we will still have our, our usual 1030 worship and then 7 o'clock in the evening. So mark your calendars accordingly. All right, I know that was a lot of news to catch up on. I think that's it for announcements. Excellent. Let's take a moment then to take a breath, center our hearts, and prepare to receive God's word today. Hear these opening words of greeting. Oh, that God would tear open the heavens and come down. Of that day or hour, no one knows, only God. Be alert. Keep awake. The time is drawing near, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so let us stand as we're able to join in singing, People Look East. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, here we have a tradition of lighting the Advent wreath, and each Sunday we'll light an additional candle until Christmas Eve when the whole thing is lit up in splendor. And so today we light the first candle as a symbol of Christ our hope. May the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
Amen. Let us join our voices together in prayer. Merciful God, we confess that we have become distracted, even weary, in our discipleship. We keep busy schedules. We rush about, captivated by technology, seduced by the lure of consumer goods. We do not remain alert to your divine presence in our lives, in the church, in the world. Make us better doorkeepers of our lives, watching for you attentively. Awaken us to your surprising power and glory and peace, so we do not miss how near you are to our very own gates. Be gracious toward us, we pray, until we are gathered from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven into your embrace. We pray in the name of Christ, who was and is and is to come. Amen. Beloved, the grace of God given to us in Christ Jesus strengthens us to the end so that we may be blameless when Christ comes again. Thanks be to God who is faithful and has called us into the fellowship of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We used to do passing of the peace just by a call and response. We're going to start to get just a little bit interactive now. If you're not comfortable with touch, just turn to your neighbor and say, the peace of Christ be with you. And if you are, then hugs or handshakes or elbow bumps or whatever is comfortable for you is good. Let's take a moment to greet one another with the peace of Christ. <laughs> And as you make your way back to your seats, I'll invite any children who wish to join me to come down. We're going to take a look at some of these cool dolls. We're going to look but not touch because I want to tell you about them. Maybe we won't have anyone. We'll see. <laughs> Excellent. We have Simone. We have Minette. Hello, my dears. You are missing one, is Rin opting out? That's totally okay. This is not forced participation time. <laughs> My own kiddos are in the nursery, I think. Hello, Miss Reagan. It's good to see you, dear. It's been a while. I miss you. <laughs> Peyton's coming down? Awesome. Hey, Peyton, how are you? Good, it's good to see you. All right, so you're, you're, my, uh, you're my faithful crew that already know a lot of the answers, I'm guessing. But I want to take some time to talk about some of these images we see here. Um, because it's really beautiful to look at, but also if you don't really know the meaning behind some of the characters, then it's just kind of nice to look at, and that's the end of it. And I'm also aware that some of our friends tuning in from home might not know all of these images. We're not going to do them all today, but we'll do a little bit today and a little bit each the next couple Sundays, okay? So here's my first question. What is this scene? What, what are we looking at here? Can anyone guess? Reagan? Yeah, where baby Jesus was born, except Baby Jesus isn't there anywhere. Why? Did we forget? No, we didn't forget. It was on purpose because we celebrate the birth of baby Jesus when? Christmas. That's right. So this is kind of our way of showing that baby Jesus hasn't been born yet in the church year, right? Like in real life he was, like 2,000 years ago. But he hasn't been born yet in the church year. We're still waiting for Christmas to celebrate. Waiting is a big part of the season we're in. So what's the deal with all these animals? Why are there so many animals in this? Like, were there animals at the hospital where you were born? I really, really hope not. <laughs> that would be very unsanitary. I agree. My kids were all born at my house. They were, we did home births, but 
Um, the only animal there was our cat, and she was in a different room. Um, yeah, no cows or sheep or anything like that. So why are there animals where Jesus was born? What's the deal with that? Where was he born? Yeah, Manette. Yeah, he was born like in a barn. Why, why was he born in a barn? We don't know this part of the story. That's cool. I, I knew I would ask enough questions to get to where I could teach you something rather than you teaching me. Um, so here's the story. When Jesus' mother was pregnant with him, she had to travel from one town to another because there was the census taking place. Do you know, you're probably the only one who would know what a census is. Do you know what a census is, Simone? Yeah. Yeah, they count all of the people. So it's something that governments will do so that they know, like, how many people there are in their area. Yeah, Reagan. Yes, exactly. The U.S. census population comes from census data. We, we use censuses in our country even nowadays. It's a thing that's really, really common. Well, back in Jesus' day, when Jesus was born, they didn't have, like, telephones or internet or even, like, the postal service, like the post office or anything. None of that existed. So the way that a census would be taken is that all of the people from that t who, who were from that town would go back to that town and literally be counted like one, two, three, four, five, like that. And that was how they took the census. So Mary was pregnant, Jesus' mother was pregnant with Jesus when she had to go from where she was living to where her her family was from, more or less, in order to be counted in the census. Well, as you can imagine, she wasn't the only one who had to travel to Bethlehem, right? So, so there were lots and lots and lots of other people who had come into town who didn't normally live there, which meant that all of the what were full. Where do people stay when they're traveling? Houses and hotels. All the hotels were full. There were no hotels with rooms available. There were no houses with rooms available. Yeah, Regan. Mm -hmm. so, so people who got there too late or couldn't afford to buy their way into a nicer space or whatever, they had the barn for shelter. That was what was offered to them. And so that's where Mary had her baby. So part of the story of Jesus is that this guy who is quite literally the son of God, who is like, the Bible calls him the most high king, like the most famous important person ever in all of the entire history of the whole world, was born in a barn with like cows mooing in the background. It's a really crazy part of the story. Yeah, Reagan. Okay, this is the part where I give Reagan the microphone. <laughs> Say it again, dear. It doesn't matter like where you're born or what situation you're put into. It just matters like what you do yourself. Like you can change the world even if you were born in the worst conditions possible. And with that I say amen. Let's pray. <laughs> dear God, thank you for the story of Jesus. Thank you for where he was born and what it teaches us today. Thank you for giving us courage and power to love others no matter what. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. High five. Thanks, kiddos. Go ahead back. Scripture reading this morning is from Mark 13, verses 24 through 37. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, 
and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves his home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, friends. One day in the church year, I get to say this, Happy New Year! <laughs> the confused rumble of the crowds. I'm not confused about what day it is. I know we've got another month yet until January, but did you know, and I know some of you did, that the start of Advent, which is four Sundays before Christmas, marks the new year in a church calendar. In the church, in church world, uh, we have what's called a liturgical calendar, which basically includes all of the special holidays and special readings and that sort of thing throughout, throughout a year. And it does follow a 12-month year, more or less, just like, just like the calendars that we use at home and at work and at school and whatnot. Um, but the church calendar starts at the beginning of Advent each year. Because the first half of the year, roughly, the beginning of Advent through Pentecost, which is usually right around Memorial Day, give or take, that's, that's when we hear the story of Jesus. And then for the other half of the year, summer through fall, that's when we hear the story of the church. So, so we're starting to hear the story of Jesus starting today with the first Sunday of Advent. Except we're also starting in a very weird place. We're at the, near the end of Jesus' teaching, as told by the Gospel of Mark, and he's telling us about things to come way at some point in the future. But again, that's, that's kind of what Advent is all about. It's about holding in tension what already is and what is not yet. It's about, it's about striking that balance between celebrating the season of waiting and anticipating and getting ready while also allowing ourselves to listen to Christmas songs on the radio whenever we feel like it. I may have started a full month ago um, when my husband wasn't with me. He would not have me start that soon. So, so Advent is, is a season where we hold in tension the fact that Christmas hasn't yet come, and yet it feels in some ways like it has. Or from a more straight-up biblical perspective, we hold in tension the reality that Jesus has already been born, and yet we know he'll come again. He's yet to come again. Advent is all about what already is and what will be. So what is this text even talking about, and what the heck does it have to do with Advent? It's an apocalyptic text, and so it's one that I would not normally choose to preach on. Um, it, it was given to us by the lectionary, so the list of suggested readings for today, and reiterated in the Advent Bible study that we're doing. So I felt like I ought to address it regardless. 
This text comes right after Jesus has predicted the destruction of the temple. And, and the hearers of his words thought that he meant that quite literally. Already in their history, they had known the destruction of the temple where God was housed or where the Ark of the Covenant was housed. And so when Jesus talked about the destruction of the temple again, it was very alarming to them, very jarring for them to hear that. That all comes before what we read this morning. We know, though, that he was actually referring to himself, that he was the temple, the house of God, the, the place where God dwelt, and that he would be destroyed and rebuilt. But now, in this morning's reading, Jesus upscales even that discourse by talking about the very upending of the whole cosmos. And of course, the disciples have a lot of questions. If you read the texts kind of before and after this, you, you hear kind of the buzz of the disciples wondering what he's talking about and what does this all mean. And, and really their questions boil down to these three. When will this all happen? How will this all happen? And what does it mean for us? Actually, a lot of people are still asking these questions today. Some of you have heard me tell the story about uh, when I was in seminary, I went to grad school in Rochester, and there was a gentleman just outside of Rochester who felt that he had done all of the calculations and knew when this would come to pass, like to a specific date. It was May 21st, I think 2012, 2011, sometime, sometime around then. And he had sold his family business and bought a van and painted something on the side of the van along the lines of repent and believe the end is near and spent a whole year driving around the country telling people that this was when Christ would return and they had better be good and ready for it. Now, one of my seminary professors uh, was this brilliant, brilliant British man who's uh, an expert in Old Testament biblical prophecies, um, specifically Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, but also, you know, books like Daniel and Isaiah and Micah and all of those. And, and a lot of the New Testament prophecies like this one are, are drawn directly from the Old Testament prophecies. So the local news station sat him down in his office, you know, picture the, the big heavy wooden desk and the wall full of books behind him and the nice leather chair, and, and they asked him a handful of questions about, about this gentleman's predictions. Where, are, where is he getting these dates from? What are your thoughts on the subject, et cetera, et cetera? And you could tell that the interviewer was pointing their questions more and more towards trying to get my professor to say whether he thought this guy was right or not, whether the world was going to come to an end on May 21st that year. And he wasn't taking the bait. And so finally, the very last question of the interview, they said to him, well, Professor, what, what do you think? Do you think that the world is going to end as we know it on May 21st? And he sat back in his chair and got this very pensive look on his face, and he said, well, I don't really know, but I should hope not, because I'm having a new kitchen built, and I'd like to get the benefit of it. <laughs> We don't know. Jesus explicitly said, we don't know when this is going to take place. And so when the disciples were asking, Jesus, when will this happen? He explicitly told them, we don't know. Even he, Jesus, didn't know when this upending of the cosmos was going to take place. They wanted to know, too, how it would happen, and really the long and short of the answer is only by the power of the Most High God. This is not something that people are going to have any control over, really. And so then their last question, and the one that's perhaps most interesting to us today, is, well then, what does this all mean for us? What does this all mean for us? Well, it depends on who us is. For the poor, the desolate, the powerless, this is very, very good news. The upending of the universe as we know it will take the lowly and elevate them, right? It's a little bit like Mary's song that we'll hear in a few weeks. For those who sit in places of relative privilege and power, though, this text is going to sound really, really scary. I like life as it is. I don't want everything upended. 
Things are good. Things are okay. I'm comfortable. I'm content. I don't want God messing with all of that. And if you're not sure which of those two camps you fall into, just examine for a moment how you felt when you heard Faye read the prophecy. Was your initial reaction, your gut response, yes, finally, thank God, God is coming, God's going to set everything right? Or was your initial response, oh, no, I don't want to think about this, I don't want to hear about this? Mine was the latter, which is why I didn't want to preach this sermon this morning. Nevertheless, here we are. So, so where in the text is the good news then? If you are like me and you hear this as scary news and yet you come to church and you see this beautifully decorated sanctuary and you want to feel all good and Christmassy and cozy and comfort and joy, right? Where in this text is the good news? Really, this, this text is an Advent message that, that has two parts to it. One is that we can celebrate the good news that Christ will come again. Against all odds, in the most unexpected circumstances, Christ came. A baby born in a barn surrounded by mooing cows. The Christ child came. Against all scientific odds, Jesus came. And so it'll happen again. The good news embedded in this text is that a world that waits for a Savior is going to know that Christ will come again. That's good news number one. Good news number two is that it gives us some instruction on what to do while we're waiting. This text is all about waiting, but it's not about sitting idly by. In fact, the text specifically speaks against that. It says, don't fall asleep while you're waiting. Keep busy. Keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. Keep preparing the way for Jesus. So how do we do that? We focus on what we are doing in the meanwhile. Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again, but hasn't yet. So what do we do in the meanwhile? Well, Jesus has not yet returned, but meanwhile, we are called to serve as God's hands and feet on earth. The world has not been reordered yet according to God's plan, but meanwhile, we can do some of the work of of flipping the script, elevating the lowly, bringing down the powerful, especially when we are the powerful. The world has not yet been reordered according to God's will, but meanwhile, there is much we can do to bear the fruit of the Spirit and to build a world that is more kind, more just, more reverent, more Christ-like, and God-honoring. And Advent is a season when we've got plenty of opportunities to do just that. Every charity in existence is going to be knocking on our doors or stuffing our mailboxes or sending us emails telling us about how we can contribute to their cause this time of year, right? But what if we took this season as an opportunity to focus specifically on what it is that God would want or what it is God would do if Christ returned today? That can help us participate in the reordering of the world before God does the rest of it. Advent is a season of waiting, and waiting is so hard. The morning after we put up our Christmas tree, my five-year-old Benjamin got up, bounded up, ran to my bed and said, Mama, did Santa come last night? And I had to say, no, baby, it's going to be another month yet before Santa comes. Oh, why? Well, because it's not Christmas yet, and so we wait. But meanwhile, we can decorate. We can watch Christmas movies. We can bake Christmas cookies. There are all sorts of things in the secular world that we can do in the meanwhile. So it is in our spiritual life. Christ has not yet returned, but meanwhile, we can feed the hungry. We can house the homeless. We can sit with the grieving. We can comfort the sorrowful. We can shine light in the dark places in the world. 
And so let's make that our Advent focus this year. Christ has not yet returned, but what can we do to get ready for him in the meanwhile? Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me as you're able to join in singing, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silent. Amen. Please be seated. As we prepare to join in prayer with and for one another, I'll lift up a number of joys and concerns that were submitted by way of the prayer book. Uh, first, just continued prayers for all of the violence that's happening in different parts of the world, for the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, for the war in the Middle East, um, between Israel and Palestine. Continued prayers for all those who are impacted by all of the war and devastation. We're being asked to pray for uh, Matthew Grant, who's a, a, an RIT student who's been missing since before Thanksgiving. And so prayers for um, his safe recovery and return. We're also asked to lift up in prayer a number of incidences of um, vehicle accidents, um, I, I didn't come across this myself on the news, but I'm reading something someone submitted, a U.S. military plane crash um, on the shores of Japan that happened a, a week or two ago. Um, a number of car accidents that have happened recently that, that are on our radar. Um, prayers for, for peace for all grieving families and for healing for those who are injured. We're also asked to pray for an end to all violence. There is so much going on in 
um, in our communities and in our nation and in the world, and violence is not of God, and so prayers for an end to that. Um, prayers for all those impacted by natural disasters, by weather-related events. And then a joy to celebrate. Uh, it's written in here, a joy, thanks to the people who decorated the church. And I would say uh, thank you to all of you who stayed to help, but a special um, elevated word of thanks to Tim and Cheryl who took point on the project, who, oh my gosh, the, the work that they do here is just beyond extraordinary. The amount of time and energy and effort they put into bringing all of this beauty to bear is um, it's breathtaking. So a word of gratitude and a word of celebration that God would, God would bring such wonderful workers into our midst. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, another joy. Thank you for reminding me of that, Alan. I'm still getting my post-vacation feet back under me. Um, we've been anxious about the state of the chimney that's up there when you're outside in the parking lot. You can turn around and look and see it. Um, it's very, very precarious at the moment, but tomorrow it's getting demolished by a professional. And so... Um, well, start to be demolished tomorrow. Yes, that clarification is important. So, um, yes, a word of uh, thanks to God that we found someone who would do the work at all and also at a, a really reasonable price. Sam. Yeah, you wrote about that, and I missed it. I'm sorry, Sam. Let me get that back out. I have a hard time hearing from this far away, but I think you wrote about it in your prayer notes. Um, you're asking us to pray about a plane crash that happened um, just in the U.S., right? Uh, a 23-year-old pilot plane flyer got seriously injured landing on a car-driven highway in Minnesota in front of traffic on November 28th. That's what you're asking me to pray for, right? Yeah. Yeah, so prayers for that pilot who was injured and for all those who were impacted by that event. Let's take a moment now to come before God in prayer. God of all power and glory, we praise you for all that you are. You are awesome and wonderful and mighty and powerful and perfect and good and love. You are love, O oh God. We confess that we often fall short in the call to love. We know that we are to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We so often find this difficult. We get distracted by the things of the world, we get pulled away by other interests. Bring us back, O oh God, into the center of your love. Forgive us for all the times when we wander away. We give you thanks, for we know that you do forgive us. You have forgiven us, and we are free from all guilt or shame. We give you thanks, O God, for we know that your mercies are new every morning, that your grace is abundant, gift upon gift. We give you thanks for the gifts that we can name this day, for the roof over our heads, the clothes on our bodies, the food and fellowship that await us. Even for the very breath in our lungs, we give you thanks, O God. All of these are gifts from you. Even so, we know that there are so many in need of your comfort and care, and so we lift them up in our hearts in a moment of stillness. We think of all those who are ill or injured, in mind, in body, or in spirit. Heal them, O oh God. We think of all who are grieving, 
especially as the holiday season is upon us. Grant them a peace which surpasses all understanding. We pray for those who are living in fear or in violence. Build a hedge of protection around them, O God. We pray for those who are living in scarcity or in poverty. We ask that each would have their daily bread. We pray for all who are imprisoned, oppressed, addicted, that you would grant freedom from all that binds. And we pray for us, O God, that you would shine through us, that you would use us as instruments of your peace and love and joy, even as we await the coming of Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let us take a moment now to give back to God a bit of that which God has given to us.
Amen. Please be seated. And let us join in the response of great thanksgiving as we prepare to receive this holy feast. The Lord be with you. <laughs> Folks who have been here long enough know that I'm going to make you do that again. Did you mean it, church? The Lord be with you. You did mean it. Wonderful. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is he, your son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things, and the rich you send empty away. Your own Son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to God, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving, as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of grain and grape. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his love. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us join our voices in the prayer Jesus taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, today we'll do communion by way of intinction, so I'll hold the plate and the cup. I'll invite you to come forward whenever you're ready. You'll take a piece of bread and dip it in the cup. I tell my children it's what you do with cookies and milk. It's the same process. 
So the table is set, the feast is prepared, and all are welcome to receive God's grace.
Thanks be to God for this holy feast. Amen. And now would you stand as you're able to join in our closing hymn, Soon and Very Soon. to receive these words of blessing and the blessing of the music that follows. All right, friends, it's happened, but not yet. It's the Christmas season, but it's not Christmas yet. Christ has come, but hasn't come again yet. But meanwhile, we watch, we wait, we do all we can to bring about the world that God would have this world be. It's happening soon, And so let's act accordingly. Amen.